and get us started. Okay, I want to welcome everyone to what is Museum Studies sixth webinar of 2023, our last one for this year. This one's a little bit different format. It's less of a um, presentation than it is a discussion. And I'll let Angela explain what that is all about. Um, I'm Brad Breedyhoff with Museum Study. We provide online professional development for people who work in or with cultural institutions. I see a few familiar um, faces or and names, uh, people who have attended past webinars and even our courses in the past. Um, today's presentation will be by one of our instructors, Angela Kipp, uh, author of the book, Managing Previously Unmanaged Collections and co-founder of Registrar Trek which um, was designed to share articles about registrars, collections, cataloging, and documenting in as many languages as possible. Angela is a professional services specialist at Gallery Systems and an independent museum consultant with a special focus on science, technology, farming, and history collections. She holds the German Museum Studies degree and has worked in the museum field since 1998. About the same time I got in. Um, she has worked for various institutions, including large and small museums and cultural projects. For over 15 years, she was the collections manager at the Technoseum in Mannheim, Germany. She specializes in logistics, project management, and the adaptation of technology for the special needs of museums. Angela also leads our course managing previously unmanaged collections. Uh, participants learn ways to approach previously unmanaged collections in general, and more specifically, how to get the process of managing their own collections started. In four weeks, we cover how to detect and manage issues like hazardous material and facility shortcomings, define a rough outline for a collection policy, <clears throat> John, uh, lay out a strategy to process the collection, and finally, we will think about networking opportunities and staff issues, even if you are the staff. This course will run next in February of next year. We are excited to have uh, such a large group from all, manage, uh, all manner of cultural institutions and collections and from more than a dozen countries around the world. Um, we have over 100 participants signed up for this, though of course not everyone will be here for the presentation. So I am recording this talk and after we're done, I will send a link to everyone who registered for it so that you can access the recording on our YouTube channel. Um, as I said, today's talk is a little different than our past webinars. Angela is looking for feedback from you to help put together the second edition of the book, Managing Previously Unmanaged Collections. But I'll let her explain. Angela? All right, thank you, Brett. Brilliant introduction, and uh, yes, uh, it it isn't a webinar. Um, I, it is more like um, I will tell you a bit about how it came to uh, that managing previously unmanaged collection. The book gets a second edition. I will kind of take you with me kind of like I'm pulling you all on my desk and uh, showing you what I have right now and what I'm dealing with. And uh, so you get a rough idea what I'm on about and what will be coming up. And then also asking you, yeah, what do you think? What ideas do you still feel need to be in there? I might throw some questions at you as, as well. So yeah, I'm just prepared a bit of to get this started a bit of a small slideshow with that um, and I hope yeah I'm I hope you can see my screen now yes uh, great yeah um, well uh, it was in 2016 that the uh, original book managing previously unmanaged collections came out and uh, now this year, uh, Charles Harmon from Roman Littlefield contacted me and asked, how do you feel about a uh, second edition? And I said, yeah, well, uh, I'm feeling good about it. Let's do that. And um, well, then he um, asked me, okay, what new things bring in there? And I was like, uh, well, 
actually, I think I said everything I had to say, and I tried to make it as concise as possible. So I'm not even sure I have anything I can add to that. And he said, well, that's perhaps not exactly good. <laughs> so um, I did what I always did. I uh, sent a blog post out and asking people around networking and uh, asked, uh, well, is there something you were missing in the first edition? Is there, what do you think I should add? What, What is up? And then I got some feedback and I put that together uh, in a, proposal for the second edition and um, I wasn't really sure if I said I can imagine a few more examples from what I missed so far, natural history, perhaps archaeological. I really love to bring in more about indigenous collections and, and perhaps sensitive uh, um, material, something like that. And I got feedback perhaps bit more on hazards for collections and so I put all this in a proposal and um, got then the feedback from some reviewers and uh, it said well this is my favorite that's why I'm showing you um, the proposal is a bit vague in places but I'm familiar with the original book the author's other work and her blog and I have seen a few messages she has posted on museum social media about her ideas for the new edition so I'm very confident that the revised manuscript will be a substantial enhancement of the previous version well that's great I I don't need to be confident about it because at that point I really wasn't that it would be what it said here but Reviewer 3, whoever it is, I love Reviewer 3, had all this confidence in me that I could pull it and pull it off. So, um, and so I will now talk about, because I'm a bit farther now in the process, uh, edited a lot, um, did two complete read-throughs and uh, I will show you what I did um, so far introduce you to it and uh, so you will see at what stage I'm now with this. The first concerns edits, um, in other words, masses in grammar, syntax and wording. Um, I wasn't aware of this because I was under the impression that the first edition is rather straightforward, well-written. And when I started to edit it, I realized it was not, it, I realized I was a German and it was showing. Because we Germans, we love to build this really long winded sentences where we try to put everything in and then we got another idea. And so we put it in the same sentence and we do another thing and then we put it in the, the sentence as well. And um, then I'm rather repetitive in some cases. And I say a lot of, you might want, uh, which is very polite, but at the same time, it makes sense. It's very, very long. And so what I'm doing a lot right now and already did is what making things clearer and more accessible. And let me show you on just one of my favorite paragraphs um, where the first one, you can read it from 2016. It is an absolutely valid sentence to do it like this ask all those questions about the collection. But actually I really, why did I make a paragraph of it? It is already like a checklist of how you can set up your documentation strategy. So why do I make it a paragraph? Why don't I just make it a checklist and say, how much data per single object do I really need? What data do I have to record now because it will be lost otherwise? what can be researched later and done by somebody else? And what is desirable optimal information? That's, it's a checklist. I just made it a checklist. And which at the same time, it's the next sentence in this completely, I, I don't cite the whole thing, but uh, the next sentence, and here you are seeing what I'm getting at, as this is, at first looks like a chaos of decisions that you just can't get right. You might want to lay out a matrix to help you make those decisions. 
There is a lot of data worth collecting about a single object, but when you are laying out your strategy, you should contemplate which data is crucial to fetch now and which might not be that important. And actually, all I want to say here is this. At first, this looks like a chaos of decisions that you just can't get right. To help you along, lay out a matrix that will guide your decisions. Two sentences and the last sentence is completely useless. So scrap that. So this is what I'm doing a lot in this. And I hope that in the end, we will have a more concise book, all in all, that is easier to read. And then the next thing I will go over is uh, to be as gender neutral as possible where gender doesn't play a role. I did this in the first edition as well. You will perhaps have realized that I often switched around stereotypes like there is a chief firefighter, although obviously most of those positions are held by men. Uh, and so, and I always try to say he or she, but it is very cumbersome, very clumsy. So for uh, this new edition, I will go with more gender neutral terms and I will use the singular they whenever there is uh, no gender specific kind of fight. Because if you think about collections management, where you really need gender for the work, I'm working in this field for 20 years and none of the work I did had to do with my gender. So. Uh, Actually, just scrap that, right? And of course, Paul, my example, Paul, the man who can do everything. It could be a woman who can do everything, but when I created him, he was male in my head, so he stays male, of course. Uh, if he doesn't decide otherwise, he's like that. Uh, but otherwise, all where I say manpower will have another wording as well. Everywhere where it doesn't play a role, we will be gender neutral. And uh, then we will have some updates and nuances. Um, the, there is, of course, an update of the resources. <laughs> Probably you should. Uh, so I will go through all the links, look if there are new editions of the book. Of course, John had a, has a new edition of uh, Things Great and Small. And so a lot of things saw the next edition in the meanwhile. And uh, I will also add more uh, resources from other uh, fields I didn't cover in the first edition to the bibliography, stuff like that. Then back then I still thought of analog photography as a thing to mention because back then many small museums still had analog for photography uh, and just worked with that. So I always had this second way of taking photos and well, now technology is really so far that we all have our little camera here, right? Uh, so really we don't have to think about having that always spelled out. If someone still uses analog, so be it, but I don't have to really put it uh, uh, in the book. So those references will go. Um, I had a recommendation that I should do the same with pen and paper. And uh, I said, <laughs> no. Because when, even if you have kind of an offline functionality that you still work with a tablet or anything, if you have a really messy unmanaged collection in some open chat somewhere in the boonies, uh, where you have dust, where you have sand, where you have everything, you don't go in there with your electronic device. And then we, we just had it in the beginning, uh, when we still weren't on here, power outage like Lori has now or uh, South Africa has now. Uh, it happens and it happens a lot more now than it did perhaps uh, five years ago. I won't let go of pen and paper because that's something that works in the middle of the night in a power cut. You still have your pen and paper and can scribble something out. So that will definitely stay in there. Then we will have a few additions. There will be a whole new chapter on, uh, well, let databases be your friend and not your worst enemy. Uh, it was the only thing that I was thinking up 
myself because I'm now working for three years for a database company. I worked with databases all uh, all my life. And so it's definitely something that can help you if it's set up great. But also in my courses for museum studies, I often had people who said, we do have a database, but it's basically, it's a second mess. I do have this partly managed collection there. And then I have something where someone tried something with the database. And I, under the impression, it is just as bad as the mess I have in actual objects. So um, this will be something that comes in. I will talk a bit more about this in a, in a minute. Um, we will have a more detailed look on the lead, legal and ethical aspects of collections that was already in the chapter back at the desk, but it will be enhanced a bit. Um, there is a discussion on temporary number versus, versus accession numbers in the chapter getting stuff done, where in the 2016 edition, I realized I was rather set in my worldview that you just never work with temporary numbers. You just give an accession number and, and are all set. And kind of, I was reading this and I was saying, I was an arrogant prick back then. I really should uh, go uh, back to that and, and add nuances because there are really a lot of difficult things around uh, numbering. And uh, the way I worded it there, I'm not get, I'm I kind of still stand behind what I wrote back then and there is a good reason why I said it but it doesn't cover all the bases and it uh, really should be done more inclusive and more thinking about all the options there so this is uh, something that will be uh, enhanced um I will, especially in the chapter storage wants and storage needs where I was rather just using the classical historical collection as a example, I will enhance that. I will have examples from natural history in there. There will be examples from, from textile collections. So there I will widen the scope a bit as well. And wherever possible, I try to bring in examples from natural history and archeological collections as far as I can do them with my knowledge or with what people are, are giving me as material. And well, then, as I said, a bit of a sneak preview of what will be coming up in this chapter about databases. Um, I looked at it and I have this part where I'm talking about how you choose a database system that is very early in back at the desk. And I was toying around with the idea to pull it into this chapter. But then I realized, no, I will leave this part that is a decision on a system very early in the book. It's good there. And it's it's a completely different thing than I'm talking in the new chapter is how do I choose a fitting system? And um, so this will be enhanced, of course, based on, on knowledge I gained, but uh, basically also just making it even more concise. And don't worry, I won't talk you into buying TMS or, or anything. It's uh, I will stand by what, what I always said. It doesn't help you if you buy a system that is perhaps not right for your collection. It's far more important that you find the one that is really fitting for your collection and often that means you are choosing one that already other uh, collections of a similar scope or in your area are using because you can exchange thoughts, you can exchange reports and so on. So it's definitely not a recommendation of one system over another. It is a discussion of how you find the one that really fits to you. And this will stay very early in the book in, in the third chapter. And the new chapter will be something else. It will set up, uh, it will, will discuss how you set up a database if you have one, uh, if you choose one, what to think about, what 
what can you use checkboxes? What are free text fields? How can you use them? What are drop downs? And uh, how can I set them up in a good way? If you look at my screenshot here, you see a drop down that contains a multitude of accession methods. And that tells me that it's definitely not a good setup. Because if you have so many things to choose from, chances are you are just uh, have no overview of what you're doing, you're taking longer to decide, stuff like that. That's that's things I will be talking about, what works and what doesn't work on the general way you're setting up a database. There will be a look at Tesori, what they can do, what they cannot do, how to choose one. So this will go in there. And then in, in one part, it will also discuss what you will do if you inherited the database and are not exactly happy with what you are seeing. So, um, and I've written now, I think half of the chapter. So this is still work in process. There might still be new things coming in here. Perhaps I will uh, talk about some things in another way than I intend now. So this is basically just you looking over my shoulder at the moment. Um, and well, I think the most important thing, uh, and so it's kind of the spoiler to all of what will come in this chapter is that databases are just tools and how good they are as tools is how good you are at using this tool and that you absolutely should avoid that you create a digital mess on top of your physical mess of the unmatched collection. So uh, this is about a new chapter. Now let me take a sip of water. And we come to the real world examples where I got the feedback um, that uh, I should include more success stories that are more inclusive. This is something I said in the proposal. I would suggest that she removes one or two of the existing one if she adds new ones, yeah. I'm also suggest using re less real life examples from the Technoseum and varying size geographic locations more greatly. It might be interesting to tie some of these to the success stories at the end of the book. And you may have guessed it. That's where you come in because this is something I can only look at what I have and what I want to swap, but um, to have examples, uh, I need you to bring them in. So I went through all the real world examples that are in there. You might remember those little text boxes that are all over the book. Um, and I identified some I think I will keep or I, I like like it for the way they are talking about stuff. It's the one about the triage at the Washington State Park and Recreation Commission. The example of hazardous material uh, from the State Historical Museum in Iowa, the one of the documentation strategy in Sweden, um, the Adopt an Artifact uh, program in the Manassas Museum, um, the reusing of old magazine cabinets from this is this is my own example and uh, a failure example is also something I feel most com comfortable sharing myself, an example where I have failed other than asking people to please tell me where, where did you fail. Uh, so this is one I definitely um, think I will leave in there just, just because I can. But there are a couple of other ones where I think I would really like to have better examples from other institutions. There is one about rooms being named in an inconsistent way. There's this example that in this institution, you had to know the name of the predecessor of the predecessor to know how what room that is. You had to know that it's Smith room because that was the predecessor of the curator of clocks who, who who is now called something else, uh, but you had to know that. So it's something like that. Grandmother's fixes. So wherever you fix something um, in a, well, in a straightforward hands-on way, um, just, uh, I had the example that we had um, huge windows 
uh, at one storage and we just painted them over with paint and it also re already reduced the light coming in. So I need examples like that from you. Um, I would love to have something about sorting collections, what, what you did. Um, of course, always more examples of hazardous material are hugely appreciated because there are basically, um, Rupert Shepard has worded it in the most brilliant way and I can't top this. He said, um, good documentation is about making sure that your objects don't kill you or something along the lines. So it's, uh, um, so there are a lot of dangers when you're working with collections and uh, I like to include more of these to kind of warn people to look twice, document good. And uh, so this is definitely missing. I would love to have an example of stellar con uh, constellations when it came to teamwork. Stellar uh, storage estimation is what can go wrong. I have one of my examples in there, but if there is a better one, I'm happy to swap, swap that out. Inconsistent shelf numbering, one of my favorites, often encountered uh, those moments where you think, why is this shelf A1 and the one next to it is set 30? One, it's uh, stuff like that. So if you encounter, encounter something like that, please get in touch and uh, tell me. Uh, well, of course, more examples of failing successfully, but as I said, I don't want to uh, force you into telling me stories about how you failed. But generally, whenever you feel you read something in the book, you have a brilliant example that is just a few uh, lines. Um, I'm happy to include them. Now, we will have more success stories. I have a few um, already promised, but um, probably can be more. Um, I'm, I'm, so I'm still looking for especially archaeological collections, um, indigenous collections. So something that is not in that realm, we have already covered in the first edition, which is basically history collections, farming collections. There we are rather good. In the other ones, we are not so good. I do have a historic house lined up, fortunately. And um, I have a, someone who has worked with NACRA, NACPRA, uh, uh, um, reassessment of a collection, but um, there's still place for other examples. Uh, just it's up. Uh, I have a deadline in May, which means I would love to see those examples by February, just to make sure we can set it up in a comfortable time uh, timeline. So there were a couple of suggestions from viewers I didn't include. I'm just giving you them to kind of, if you think I should include them, I'm now telling you why I don't include them and you might feel free to tell me I should include them. It's one that the suggestions that there is a list of materials that are uh, good storage materials and some that are bad or some that are okay and some not okay. And I first thought it is a good idea, but then I kind of shied away because on one hand, what I'm trying to do is to say, this is just a book um, about where you find the information. It's not about the information itself and research is going on and you can research uh, and find resources about good material. But also I want to avoid, one is, I like that it's so thin, so you can, you know, throw it at the internet and say, read it. Uh, and the moment I start to get too much things in, it might end up being like this. And so not really, uh, I mean, it's a great book. It's uh, uh, the museum registration methods and I love it, but, it's nothing you carry around when you are dealing with an unmanaged collection. It sits on your desk, right? And I wanted to avoid to have this book uh, become too overarching and also being too fast outdated. And the other thing I want to avoid is that um, 
often when you are dealing with an unmanaged collection, your problem is you don't have the material. You, you know you would have to have asset-free packing material, but all you have are cardboard boxes, but you have a flooded cellar. So you go in with the cardboard boxes and uh, try to save your collection. And the, a list that says cardboard boxes bad doesn't help you. So this is why I left that out. And the other one is about managing unmanaged digital collections. Now, this is the point where I think that's a great topic. That's definitely something that's missing. This would be a brilliant gap for someone going in there and writing, managing previously unmanaged digital collections, because there are so many things that you have to consider. And like the reviewer said, it requires a different approach to physical artifacts. But there we have to come back to myself. When I'm writing a book, um, I'm writing and can stand behind that book because it is my own experience and the one I know from working closely together with colleagues who are in a similar situation. I had never to deal with a digital collection. If I start trying to include that, it's something else than when I try to include specimen from a natural history collection, where I still, from my collections manager perspective, have an idea about the needs. I'm still very, very careful about that and will consult a lot with people who really do the work, but it's still, it is in my field. But if I start writing about digital collections, I'm absolutely leaving the field where I'm competent in. And that was where I'm I can talk about some of the things like taking regular backups of your data, perhaps how to perhaps number your digital files when you photo, uh, do photography or something like that. But caring for digital collections, whoa, I think someone should write a book about that and not include it in something that is mainly about dealing with the physical objects. So let's see, I think, yeah, we are really at the point I would like to open up the discussion and uh, yeah, asking you what you thinking about that, what do you think, hey, you should, you haven't mentioned this and that, you should include it or talk about your experience. Um, I'm just now stop sharing my screen and yeah, hand it over to you. Sorts idea. I see Elizabeth Morse with the hands up. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Hello. And thank you, Angela. I just wanted to inquire have you uh, familiarity with the reorg method? And is that included in your first book? I'm sorry, I don't have it here. And will you include it in the second? It's it's uh, included in the first already. I love Reorg. It's a great approach um, to it. So basically, when Reorg started to develop, um, um, I was already in the process of writing a book. And at a, for a short while, I, I stopped and said, "Should I be still doing that? If if uh, really uh, um, the icon is added and and doing a brilliant work, I, I, uh, and then I looked at it and said, okay, uh, it is." exactly the same way I'm going. Um, so we kind of, I think, can kind of partner up. There are a couple of things that are really like siblings. So uh, um, I'm doing perhaps the shelf numbering a bit different than them, but but basically the way they are doing stuff, it's it's brilliant. So it's I have some references to reorg and like recommending just just look at at the reorg checklists for that or, or for this. So yeah, that's it's it's great. It's definitely something that should be known more. And uh, yeah, I I great would say uh, I would just add that um, when reorg is particularly successful, it is because there are no previous locations on the objects because you're going to go in and you really are reorganizing 
the storage space, the shelving, the walls, the yeah. closets, the cabinets and so forth. So it's a lot easier to have that freedom um, to arrange by size, by height, by class, et cetera, et cetera, rather than to be locked into a previous cataloging system or numbering system, I should say, location system, if you know what I'm saying. Anyway, I've said yeah. too much. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely getting that. It's a kind of, um, I think it's, it's great if you can do that. Um, you have to some in some regard really have to think what you are doing if you have an existing system but it still got messy and uh, so often it is the totally unmanaged collection is far easier to handle than the one yes where indeed all is some, yes some, some, yes yeah, yes yeah, yeah. yeah. yes so and and this is kind of why I included this passage in the chapter about databases. Um, um, but what you, do you do with the existing one that is messy yes. and it's there? So what are you doing with that? So um, and and also with with reorg, it's it's kind of the same. Uh, if you have the possibility to pull really all the art artifacts out of a room, reshelve it, and then neatly organize it back into that's great, but often you don't have that. You kind of have to gnaw your way into an existing storage space and just start at one point where you can move and create more space you can move into. So yeah, kind of, that's why I said, I, it, it was one of the things I realized and uh, also something that I think why my approach still has a possibility to, to stand there as a book because it kind of will help you if it's not as as ideal, you can't do that. Thank you, thank you. All right, and I see Emma C has her hand up. Yeah, um, also no one ever pronounces my name right, so good job. <laughs> I know why, because it's German. Um, but uh, so I guess one of the questions that I had was about, do you reference either as um, tips as part of other chapters or anything kind of about the process of like succession planning of the, okay, you started this management project, how, and you have to leave suddenly, or you're, you know, you had an intern working on it and they had to, you know, their thing only lasted so long. Um, there is that succession planning initiative that I'm part of. And I was just curious if kind of that plan of, okay, you started, but then what is, if, I'm curious how you reference that as part of the book. Um, I have a concept called logical exits in them, which I think goes into the same direction. So um, I always recommend, and the first chapters are actually naming very concrete goals to go towards as logical exits. So logical exits are points at which you can leave off without losing all the process because what often the problem is, and I don't have to tell you if you are making uh, succession planning, is <clears throat> if you leave off and then come back, perhaps not you yourself ever, but perhaps you yourself, but after six months, I mean, we all had this uh, with uh, COVID, right? Uh, that we suddenly had to leave off and then had six months later, one year later, somehow know where we left off. So at the core of uh, the book is this idea of uh, logical exits where you have uh, um, all your resources together, your documentation of what you found in the collection um, when you first approached it. So uh, little steps and, and plans that you document and to that will be there even if you are pulled out of the process. So I think the first logical exit is that you actually just have completely your documentation of this is just photos of what you had there and, and a, a list of all the issues you spotted. So this might be done in a week or something uh, uh, and it's there. And even if you only come back to this collection in, in two years, it will still be there. Or if someone else takes over, this is there. So one of the things that I also recommend in one of the first chapters is that you are doing a diary of what you did at that day 
at the evening, that there is an evening routine in which you write down what you have done, you backed up your files, and you made sure um, that they are accessible, and also that you store your basic information in a way that someone else knows what is where, that in case of an emergency, when you are hit by a bus, uh, it is not that the next one has to start at point zero, but the next one can start at the low, last logical exit or the last evening you left off. So this is a, a strong, strongly intertwined concept in the book. Yeah. No, that's great to hear. I just, I, it's now especially in my head all the time. So I always like to ask, and I think it's a thing yeah. that we all think about, but never, maybe never have time to talk about. And I guess I do have an example of like the consistent room naming and shelf numbering, but we are mid process. So I don't know if I can call it a success story yet, but we are dealing with that like legacy location. You know, it's not necessarily an unmanaged collection in the same way of like you walk into a shed, nothing has been done to it, but it's the people don't remember the names that things were or those names change different to for different people and all of that kind of stuff and even the nomenclature of the same name was written differently in our database and how we're dealing with that so that sounds great uh, I, if you could submit this it, it wouldn't be a success story like you say but uh, i need it as a real world example mm -hmm. just to put there in the chapter where i'm talking about uh, um, consistent location naming uh, mm -hmm. so, if you could write that up, I would be most grateful for it. Will do. Right. <laughs> Great. So, other remarks, ideas? There's been a few in the chat. And when, oh, yes. I, when I capture the, the recording of this, I will also capture everything that's in the chat. That would be great. So let me take a look. I, I didn't take a look at the chat and I see 37 messages. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there I were have... some supporting comments. Like there seems to be consensus. Don't get rid of the pencil and paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to assure everyone I, I hope no one heard me laughing while she was presenting because she made me laugh a few times. Um, I want to ensure you that if you take her class, it's like that all month. <laughs> right. I, I, I mean, the word is a sad enough place and uh, you have to keep that sense of humor. Uh, um, otherwise, you go mad. And it's especially true for unmanaged collections. You Sometimes you want to scream and it's better, better to just... Yeah, find something funny to laugh about. So, pen and paper. A lot of support for pen and paper, I see. <laughs> Talk about the process of choosing a database. Yeah, definitely mm -hmm. with yeah. something uh, uh, we one, have to talk about. Yeah. One suggestion you, you mentioned that you didn't want to include a table of good and bad materials because of the... Wait, there is a fairly recent book just came out, I believe, last year, Practical Approaches to Collections Care by Samantha Forskull that is quite good and has those tables in it. So you might want to just reference that. It's, exactly. It's a That's really good well, recent uh, single volume source and not very, not very complicated. So, but yeah, really yeah. Good the, what's the title, John? It's Practical Approaches to Collections Care. It's Samantha Forskull. And it's uh, published by Routledge. And yeah. she is at, uh, let's see, at uh, the Smart Museum of Art at Chicago. And I know her from the CCAHA in, um, in Philadelphia. Yeah, and it's what I always thought about just my book, just pointing to where the good stuff is. So um, that's definitely one of the resources I will mention. Yeah, in the plant world, collections often have duplicates, possibly could get more information by contacting other institutions that may have a duplicate of the collection, especially could be helpful in the case where you have the data, but may the specimen had been damaged due to this management, yeah, being unmanaged before reacting to institutions. That's that's all that ties into what I'm talking about in this chapter called the power of coffee that um, often making those connections to 
colleagues will help you tackling your own unmanaged collection and at the same time helping others really by just saying yeah we have data for this space i mean perhaps you don't have the data ours is damaged but here um we we can kind of make our knowledge of the specimen uh, more complete with why we can contribute our data. So. Oh yes, that's a other good one. There may be more of discussion comments recommendation to include in the book for the circumstances when you are coming into someone else's management style without having previously followed your methods. Yeah, that that can be, especially if this uh, um, person is still on staff. It's it's definitely uh, one of those things where I again say power of coffee goes a long way. Um, doesn't have to be coffee; can be tea or. Uh, clear water or whatever but yeah that's definitely something those those uh the thing i always included in my book uh breaking a convention that you don't is those soft factors of of really uh, where you have to deal with other people and that's kind of the problem so uh, or not the problem but kind of makes difficult conversations and and uh, um I think I have that a bit, but I might reread the chapter again and think if I want to include more about what to do if it's not completely unmanaged, it was managed and it was done that way. I, I will definitely look into that again with this focus. Yeah, going back to what Emma brought up, it's so important to document what we do. I mean, that's yeah. that, that's why we have this unmanaged collection because it wasn't documented well enough what we did and why we did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a spreadsheet that locks each location, how it is referred in the database and any approvations. Oh yes, that can be very helpful, especially if you can't have in your database like uh, the alternative terms, like so you can ha have your location hierarchy where there this is room one and shelf three, and you can't reference and room one, it's Smith room or also known like that vault down there or something like that. Yeah, definitely helpful to have a spreadsheet. Good idea. Even list each draw and boxes to have a limited application. Oh yes, that's that's an important thing. We have at least 20 legacy spreadsheets that contain information that didn't make it in the past perfect migration. I have taken to adding a readme tab describing everything I figured out about each spreadsheet so that the next person who encountered it doesn't have to repeat the research. We rely on these old spreadsheets to try to reconstruct where unaccessioned objects came from. Yes, yes, yes. It's it's a, and and you are lucky if you have legacy spreadsheets and it is not some uh, wild scribbled uh, unlegible um, kind of stash of papers you have to go through uh, so yeah it's uh, and and don't get rid of those spreadsheets right <laughs> just the same as though you don't get rid of those papers because it's still there, right? It's uh, you might want to hark back to it if you are doubting what you find in your database. So yeah, I feel you there. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good one. The soft factors that you mentioned of dealing with other people is important, but I'm curious if you mentioned anything about the self care aspect of that. I know that we all felt that during COVID. Actually, the very first chapter of managing unmanaged collection is about that. It's uh, about getting into the mindset as a project manager from just being a collections manager, but it was also very much about um, making sure that you are aware that you are not a white knight. You are not the one who is saving the world. You are 
a human being and there is a part that you are giving to collections work but there is also a part that you shouldn't go give into collections work so uh, um actually this is this was kind of my starting point is uh, um all those those aspects and and it's also other aspects like um part of why you are documenting is you are kind to your future self and just as important is it to be uh, forgiving and kind to your past self because and, and your past self might be yourself or um, you're the one who had the job before you because often you start cursing at the one how could they do it like that they, they must have known that this would damage the objects but you don't have no idea what the situation was back then. Uh, they probably tried to do the right thing, but didn't know better. They tried and were pushed back by management. Uh, something like that, you don't know. So we have this kindness as, at heart at a point. And be kind to yourself, especially take good care of yourself. Be aware that you are not working 24 seven for this collection because in the end, the collections won't love you back, right? It's uh, it's good that you are passionate about your job, but it's just as important that you take care of yourself and don't uh, um, burn yourself out in this uh, uh, job that is an unmanaged collection. I, I, since COVID, I'm seeing a lot more written and a lot more discussion on self-care in our industry. Um, so there is more out there available on that topic for people who are interested. Oh, yes, not my fault. I didn't get it here, but I'm here to make it better. Is is my mantra from after reading the first edition. That's a good mantra. I, I love mantras. It's uh, something that kind of uh, keeps you going, keeps you also grounded. And when I found myself going down rabbit holes, this is where it is. Where do I go from here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just, it's, yeah, it's often you have to pull yourself back on it and, and try to see the big picture. Also to really uh, sometimes take this step back and say, is what I'm doing here really necessary? And the wisest thing to do at the moment, just take a step back and look. Perhaps I'm I'm just, you know, uh, fighting a fight that at the moment is not worth fighting. It's perhaps I just need to step step back and do something else uh, until perhaps this this issue not magically resolved itself, but perhaps often constellations change and then uh, going back in there. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's actually something I'm still not sure how I will address this. Is is another difficult. Uh, topic that also comes in with this whole discussion of, uh, you know, uh, um, dealing with soft factors. I do have this um, in the failing successfully scenario where you are just meeting someone who you can't, who can't work with you because they don't like your working style, because they are prejudiced against it. And what I realized where I'm hitting kind of a wall is that I was writing this rather from my perspective who might have to deal with people not liking women. But uh, that is basically, that's a prejudice I can go against, work around. And where does it become really toxic and how do I address it when it comes to racism? and stuff like that. And I realized that in 2016, I was just writing this from my perspective and my perspective is always trying to find the workaround and trying to go uh, um, perhaps find someone else who doesn't meet that prejudice and who then talks to this one from upper management. What I didn't address because as a member of the majority, I'm not subject to racism. How do I tackle it if it is outright racism. Of course, nobody's run, running around and doing this decision saying uh, this is racist, right? It's a, I'm, I'm doing that because uh, I don't like the color of your skin. No one will do that. They will do that with this little, you know, uh, um, picking and just finding things that seem to be uh, um, based in reason, 
but are indeed racist. I, I'm not still absolutely not sure how I will handle that part because it kind of, on the one hand, I think it's something I should uh, include there. On the other hand, I'm not in the position to, to include that as someone who is not subject to racism. And that is still something. If someone has thoughts, ideas on that, it, it goes into a direction that is going away from collections work as such, but as it is interwoven in our society and it happens, I'm absolutely at a loss how I will deal with that. So any thoughts on that are very, very welcome. You you might want to talk to our instructor who teaches our cultural competency course, Helen Wong Smith, about that. She has had experience with that personally and she might have some some suggestions. Yeah, I will do that definitely. Oh yes, there's another good mantra. Don't try to boil the ocean. <laughs> that's that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, and regarding the going down rabbit holes uh, uh, and, and being careful not to get too caught up in getting off track, that's the point of developing that matrix at the beginning and always going back and checking, is what I'm doing really satisfying the, the line items that I created in that matrix? And if not, should I be doing it? That's a good point, yeah. So, more thoughts, more ideas, more have you thought about this one? So definitely, if you have any thoughts or examples that you think might be useful to Angela, you can email those to her after we're done. And I'm going to put contact information in as soon as I get it up here. Um, that's this here. So that is Angela's email if you have anything that you want to communicate directly to her. Yep. Right, yeah, don't don't hesitate to reach out to send me your thoughts and so as I mentioned, this is our sixth webinar for this year. Um, there will be more next year. I think the next one will probably be in January or February, and it's going to be by Shannon Palmer, who leads our community engagement course. Shannon is from Australia. And I have another one. If someone uh, has TMS, uh, um, using TMS, there will be a webinar on January the 31st um, on managing unmanaged collection with TMS uh, collections. So it's very specific. I guess most of you don't have it, but if you have, it's just it comes up in the gallery systems community. So this. It's kind of what I'm. I'm. I'm trying to. Uh, uh, don't be specific about database systems in the book, but of course, if I have a specific database system to talk about, then I can talk about how to manage uh, uh, unmanaged collection with the help of. But I can't, uh, and I will never tell you uh, by gallery systems TMS. But if you have it, come over. So, thank you for all the nice words I read in the chat. <laughs> it's it's nice. It's great if I, I, I hear find those kind it, of comments know. about the book all the time. That's that's great. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's I'm glad it's frequently mentioned when people ask questions about how to do deal with something in the various Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups and other places, um, like the collection management group on Facebook. I've seen it recommended there several times. That's great. And I hope to make it even more helpful uh, with the new edition. So it's hopefully worth the investment of 
but I'm I'm confident and if I get a few more real world examples and success stories, I hope I can make it even more valuable to you. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate you um, sitting in on this with us and, and offering us your thoughts and ideas. Um, it's very helpful. I hope everyone awesome. has a good finish to the year and uh, hopefully we'll see you again next year. Yes, same for me. It was great that you were all here and helping and making comments and um, I, I, even just showing up. It's uh, so appreciated. I see there is interest for a new edition and, and people wanting to, to hear what it's about. It's a great motivator. So thank you very much. And yeah. Have a nice, yeah, whatever you celebrate. And if you celebrate in all account, have a great rest of your year, a good start in the new year, 2024. Let's hope it's a better and more peaceful one than this one ended. So, all right. goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you, bye.